All right, cool. And let me share my screen. Okay, so you should be able to see the worksheet on your screen now. Uh, okay, let me make sure I can view chat easily. Let's see. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I have chat uh, visible to me, so you guys can use that throughout the session. Uh, shouldn't be a problem if you say something over audio as well while we're going over the problems. All right, cool. Um, so, all right. So I was thinking, uh, so for this worksheet, I was thinking I'd skip the first one uh, because I probably won't have time to get through all of them anyway. Uh, and as always, there's there are full solutions to each of the problems. Uh, on GitHub. So, all right, so I was thinking, uh, starting with two, um, I actually also wanted to skip the first one. Uh, that that This is a, a direct consequence of uh, the empty type induction principle. Uh, so it's not too interesting, uh, but part two of this problem gets more interesting. Um, so we have A and B types. Uh, we have the inclusion maps, the left and right ones into the co-product. And we want to prove that uh, both of these maps are embeddings. Okay, so let me, so this is a problem two, part two. Okay. Uh, so we want to, so let's consider uh, the in left case. Uh, so uh, the in left case is this map into the co-product. And uh, we want to prove it's an embedding, which means that uh, if we let X and Y be any elements of A, uh, then we want to prove that this um, app map, which goes from uh, this path type to this path type um, is an equivalence. Uh, so we wanna show this is an equivalence, okay. Um, so, uh, the usual way we do this, and this will be true here, is we want to uh, find an inverse of this map here. Uh, okay, do we have any candidates that we might want to consider for an inverse? And uh, so this map will be we'll have type um, going in the other direction. Any ideas on what we could put for this, for this function? Could we do path induction on x equals y and suppose that y is judgmentally x and that path is graphical? Well, uh, we're not going to be able to get a function directly from that because uh, here the domain type doesn't have a free endpoint. Uh. So uh, we can't do that directly. Um, now, I uh, Maybe a good way to think of this is, uh, so, you know, alternatively, we could be thinking about 
a map that we have for which this app map is an inverse of it. So is there, I mean, let's think of any maps that we can, even ignoring this app for the moment, are there any maps that we, natural maps that we can think of that have this type? There was something we saw in lecture. Oh, I see. Uh, um, uh, there's some chat. Let's see. Uh, so I, uh, I see PR one. I'm a um. You may mean something else, but we don't have any projection functions here. Um, for the co-product, we only have inclusions that come equipped with it. Um, okay. Uh, co-product elimination, yeah, uh, we um, we sort of we we are we are going to be using co-product elimination at, at least secretly we will be. Um, but the map I want to point us to is uh, this is a map from a lecture um, that gave us the um, observational equality of co-products. Um, so I uh, we have this map that takes in any two elements of the coproduct and then an identity term and it gives us back an element of the uh of the observational equality for S and T. Um, now, uh, oh, uh, sorry, let me, uh, let me just get rid of this for a second. Okay, uh, now, uh, so okay, what do we, so we have this sort of family of maps, uh, this dependent function. What, um, anything, we can apply this function to, to specific elements of A plus B to get a map that we want. Uh, so I'll just write it out here. Um, let's consider this map applied to in left X, in left Y, that gives us, so this will give us a function with the exactly correct domain type. And uh, its output will be whatever this observational equality is on these included terms. All right, um, so uh, we need, this is not like on the surface, this is not exactly the type we want. We want this X equals Y. Uh, now, some of you may remember, or maybe even it may be uh, even able to just guess that um, this that this uh, this sorry uh, this type here was defined by pattern matching on coproducts. So there's the coproduct elimination coming into play uh, to be exactly x equals y that identity type. Um, so let me, uh, in my, let me just uh, add a page. All right, so uh, yeah, so as I was saying, this, um, is actually 
definition definitionally equal to um, the identity type. Okay, so so uh, therefore we can put um, this map applied to in left x in left y here and use it for our possible inverse. Okay. Um, now, I, so we, uh, so how, okay. So let's, let's start verifying that this is actually an inverse. Uh, let's start with, uh, so let's start with proving that uh, app is a section or a right inverse of this reverse map. Um, so, and yet, so what can we do here? So we're, we're trying to prove that this is a right inverse of this map. Any ideas on what principle we could use to do that? So writing this out, um, let's call for brevity, let's call this uh, map F and let's call this map G. So uh, I want to prove that this is for each p um, in the type x equals y. What's what is this? Any is there a principle that we have that seems perfect for this to construct a term of uh, this type here? So we're taking an element of the identity type. So for each element P here, we want to prove this identity. Yeah, okay, so path induction. Uh, so we're gonna, oh, I've been using, uh, let, okay, so the three, uh, the th I want to be consistent with the book but it's easier to write the three lines. So uh, let me just say that um, these three lines in case uh, it's not clear uh, is my symbol for definitional equality, even though the book uses uh, two lines and a dot on top. Uh, so, okay. So let's say it's REFL on X. So now, um, so now, I, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I did, there's met, yeah. So if you're referring to in the comments, if uh, you're referring to the confusing notation for uh, definitionally quality, yeah, there's a lot of different ones. Um, okay, so, uh, so now what do we know this? So what, um, so when we have REFL here, what does uh, what does G on REFL become? No, okay, well, I'll just, um, so th this uh, will become uh, equal to uh, REFL on, okay. Um, and now, uh, let's see, uh, going back to our map here. Um, so uh, we, 
Um, so we, uh, so let's see, uh, we, uh, we now have, um, So we are applying this map equid uh, to uh, the REFL term, and uh, so I I didn't completely review how we uh, define this map in lecture, but uh, we did in fact define this map by path induction as well, um, and. Uh, so, um, so I, uh, I uh, let's see. Um, when, yeah. So, um, so, so G. Sorry. So, uh, So uh, when we defined it by path induction, we uh, uh, we made uh, we made it compute to what on REFL. So, uh, we defined we defined this map by path induction. So when S was the same as T, and we input REFL, what term do we output? Okay, well, as all right. Um, so, uh, in the case when, uh, so uh, when we on this map, uh, we, uh, in the case when we input REFL and the output um, had the form, um, of the observational equality on in left X in left y, we output uh, exactly, oh, sorry, in, um, sorry, uh, of course this should be, in left, oh, shoot, uh, I keep writing the wrong thing. Uh, in left X as well, that uh, we put as the REFL on X, um, which is exactly P in this case. So by path induction, we do have a homotopy showing that uh, G is a right inverse of F. Uh, so why, um, okay, so the first, um, Yeah, I uh, G. Yeah, it is. It is. Sorry, it is. Because G, because app is defined by path induction as well, which gives us a computation rule. 
Okay. Um, so uh, let me, uh, so that's, so, okay. So um, now, uh, again, I'm asking you to remember from lecture that, uh, that uh, this map we actually showed was an equivalent. So we showed that that equivalent has G as a right inverse. And you might also remember from past lectures or from the book that a section of an equivalence uh, is also a retraction of that equivalence. So it turns out that uh, uh, G is a two-sided inverse of F and therefore itself is an equivalence, which proves that uh, in left is an embedding. Okay. Um, now, uh, now I, I do, uh, now I just wanna, in case it wasn't clear, um, I did, I want to make sure uh, to say that uh, we, when we defined this map in lecture by path induction, we, we assumed S is the same as T, and then we had to output a term of, of the observational uh, equality for um, something like SS. And we did that by um, first, showing that for any element S in the coproduct, this type here is inhabited, it has an element. So we constructed a function from A plus B, uh, a dependent function from A plus B to this type. And uh, we did that by pattern matching on the coproduct. And as a result, we could reduce in the case of in left, in left, to um, to uh, just the refl path, right? So that's that's what that's what's going on under the hood in this uh, equal ID for the coproduct. Okay, so that's where all this comes from. So I, it does require you to remember some things about that definition. Okay. All right. So uh, in right is uh, is a similar situation. So uh, I won't review that one. I and uh, but I do want to um, talk a little bit about uh, the third part here. Um, so again, we have A and B types. Um, we want to prove that this inlet function is actually an equivalence, not just you know we we were talking about embeddings before. We want to talk. We want to prove it's an equivalent if and only if B is empty, which I think would seem plausible. Um, but let's see how it would go. Uh, So, um, so part three here. Uh, so let's first, so in one direction, um, uh, suppose uh, in left uh, is an equivalence. Uh, and let's say it has, uh, uh, let's say it has uh, inverse, two-sided inverse. Uh, called psi. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, this of course, has a function type that goes from the coproduct back into A. And um, let's, uh, so we want, so what, so okay, so we want to show B is equivalent to the empty type. Uh, now, what do we get from this assumption that uh, psi is an inverse of in left? We can then say that in left on psi of uh, uh, in right on B. And okay, so here I'm letting B be an element of B, a big B. Okay, so in right of that little B. Um, that has to be equal to in right on little b, right? 
because uh, we have inverses here in left and side. So, uh, oh, I think I'm missing parenthesis. Um, so, but what's the problem here? Does anyone, does anyone see the problem? Or not problem, I guess. How do, how do we get from an element of this identity type to proving that B is empty? So we have an, we're saying that an element included from the left is equal to an element included from the right. You might remember from observational equality on co-products again, that this is actually equivalent to the empty type. So from an element to this, so in particular, we have a map from, from here, um, from this to, um, the empty type. So since, since we actually do have a term here, we get an element of the empty type. So what does that prove? It proves since we, from an assumption that we have an element of big B, we get an element of the empty type. So this is saying that not B and, uh, of course the map in the other direction comes from empty type induction, and it's uh, a small exercise, I guess, I'll leave to you to prove that those are inverses of each other. Um, in general, if we, can, if we can prove not B, not, if we can prove not B for uh, any type B, then B is equivalent to the empty type, okay? So that's one direction. Um, now, how about, that was one direction. How about the other direction? Um, suppose we have an equivalence, not sure. suppose we have an equivalence um, that uh, goes from B to the empty type and uh, Uh, we want to um, we want to prove now that uh, in left is an equivalence. So uh, let's do that as usual by defining an inverse of in left. So define uh, let's say um, phi and uh, we want it we want it to be an uh, inverse to uh, in left. So uh, we have we want to function out of the coproduct. That should say to us coproduct elimination. So let's pattern match on in left and in right. On an element from in left, let's say that uh, we uh, output. Uh, we want an element to a. So I, we really only have one choice here, little a. And then uh, from in right, uh, what can we do here? So we're saying that I, uh, I, uh, okay. So I mean, we're uh, we're saying that we're given an element, little b of big B that's nested in the in right here. We want an element of big A. The one, the one thing we have to remember is, uh, is that we assumed that we have an equivalence, a func in particular a function from big B to the empty type. So we can apply that equivalence to little b and then use empty type induction, right? So that will look like this, okay? Cool. Um, so that's, these are fees. Um, all right. So we have a map. I'll, uh, it's not too hard to then show that uh, this map is a two-sided inverse. 
of inlet. Okay, so I'll, in the interest of time, I'll leave that to you. I do. I want to um, make a final remark. Well, actually, I think. Um, oh yeah, there is a second. It's not really a remark, it's the second part of the, this part three. Conclude that if both A and B are contractible, then A plus B is not contractible. So this is in particular an example where we don't have closure, a, a closure condition under a type form. Um, so, okay, we wanna prove that, uh, that if we have contractible, so now uh, suppose, a, B um, are contractible. Want to show not is contractible A plus B. All right. So um, with any, you know, this is a function type. So let's, so suppose for contradiction, basically, that A plus B is also contractible. How can we get an, an element of the empty type now? Okay, so we have A, we have A plus B, and we have B, all of these are now assumed to be contractible. Now, in particular, contractibility means we have an equivalence with the unit type, right? So, um, So we have in left, and then instead of putting B here, let me instead put the unit, and let me now draw the maps that are equivalences from A to the unit and from A plus B to the unit. And these are equivalences because of contractibility. What can, what can we conclude now? First of all, let's notice that this triangle commutes, right? From here down to there is the same as from here to there, in particular because the codomain is the unit type. So we have this commuting triangle. We have equivalences on the left and right. We may now remember at this, from somewhere at this point, it, at, at the very least, we had a uh, worksheet um, on property on a on a on a triangles such as these um, that uh, let us conclude that uh, the top map, which is in left, is also an equivalence. Okay, so. We have in left as an equivalence now. So let's think of the context we're in. We're supposed to conclude from the first part of this part three that, that uh, somehow uh, A plus B is not contractible, okay? Uh, how can we, from here, how can we use the first part of the problem to get to that conclusion? So we have in left as an equivalence. What have we proven so far that will tell us that, whoops, that A plus B cannot be contracted? Is what we want. So the first part said that the inclusion is an equivalence just in case what? Just in case B is empty, okay? So, B is empty, right? Okay, 
So uh, a plus, we want a plus b is not contractible. This is a fun, you know, this is the function type uh, is to the empty. We'd assumed an element to this. We want an element of this, but we now have an equivalence that says that if we can get an element of big B, we can get an element of this empty type, which is exactly what we need. How can we get an element of big B to apply this to apply this function here to it? What do we think? What do we know about big B in this problem? So at this point, that would say we can get an element of it. And then finally an element of the empty type. Any thoughts? Let's uh, remember here that we assumed that A and B are both contractible, okay? So B is contractible, which means that B is also equivalent to the unit type. So, it, um, so this has an element, so we can map that element back to an element of big B, and then finally apply this function here to get an element of the empty type, right? So that's exactly what we want. Um, and that shows that A plus B is not contractible in this situation. Okay. Um, any questions on uh, this problem, problem two? Okay. Uh, let's keep moving. Um, so um, next, uh, I wanted to look at problem three, um, hopefully both parts. Uh, so problem three uh, tells us that uh, we have this, um, community triangle and the first part says that we're going to assume G is an embedding. So from this, we want to prove a by implication that F is an embedding if and only if H is one, OK? So let's start with. Uh, the forward direction. So uh, suppose F is an embedding. We want to show H is an embedding. Now, okay. Uh, the key to both parts of these of this problem uh, is is a bit of a clever observation. Um, we um, so I want to um, so when we when we, you know we've seen a problem in the past in a past worksheet where we have a commuting triangle and we assume that. Uh, some of the arrows in it have a property. I think it, in particular we've, we've, we've assumed that. Uh, maps or equivalences, and we want to show that we can conclude that uh, other maps in the triangle are equivalences, um, maybe under certain assumptions, further assumptions. So let's, so we have, we have that, we have those, we, we've seen that we have those uh, properties when it comes to equivalent equivalences, and embeddings are defined in terms of equivalences. So, um, that leads us to maybe considering a, trying to form a commuting diagram um, of equivalences or possible or, or potential equivalences when we make certain, and that become equivalences uh, under certain assumptions. 
and from that commuting diagram, we can we can uh, prove that other arrows in that diagram are also equivalent to it, just like we did in the past. So we're going to need to pass to identity types for that here because embeddings are defined as equivalences between identity types. Okay, so what kind of things can we form in this context? We have um, uh, from H, from the map little h, we can uh, form um, an arrow into h of x equals h of y. And just to be clear, uh, these x and y come from big A. So uh, what else can we do? Uh, we can take the same thing with f. Um, and then as our original commuting triangle suggests, we can then from the h of x equals h of y, we can then go to uh, g of h of x to g of h of y. And this is mimicking the fact that g composed with h is homotopic to f. So, uh, so okay, so let me uh, be clear here. So this is app of little g for h of x. h of y. Um, okay, so we have these arrows, but we want, we really want to, we want to close this diagram to potentially get a commuting uh, diagram for, you know, and then use it to, to get, uh, to, to prove that uh, some of these maps are uh, equivalences, i.e. that uh, we have embeddings. Uh, so there's a map from this identity type to this identity type. And uh, where does it come from? Uh, well, it, uh, okay, so uh, from our original assumption of the commuting triangle, we have, um, Oops, G, sorry. We have a homotopy like this. Uh, let's call it big H. So, uh, so um, We can then get a square of paths um, uh, So this is H applied to X. This is H applied to Y. Um, so let me actually, to be clear, let me uh, let me uh, erase these for the moment. And um, look, all right, so let me talk about this map here. Uh, if we have a uh, path from f of x to f of y, then we can form a path down here by going around um, first to here, then to first to there, then to there, then down to here. Um, and then similarly, if we have a start with a path down here, uh, I shouldn't draw it. I mean, if we start with a uh, path down here, then we can uh, get a path up here by uh, 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 going uh, um, down here to there, up to there, okay? So, so, so actually we, we, in fact, we have back and forth maps and it's not too hard to check that these are inverses of each other. So in particular, 
this map I just described is an equivalence. Okay, so that's always true here. All right, so we have this interesting commuting square. Um, I'm actually gonna erase this. For, I think it'll be clearer. So now that we have this square, let's see what we can do with it in, uh, uh, in this problem. So, so we've assumed that F is an embedding. Uh, what does that mean? That means that this down here, oh, sorry, I should finally, I keep saying this is a, uh, a commuting square, but I, I didn't quite, uh, I didn't quite say why it's commuting, right? I, I said what all these maps are in all the directions, but how do we prove it's commuting? We need to prove for each element of this, of this type x equals y, that the map applied to that, um, the, that when you uh, input that element and then go down and then to the right, it's the same as inputting that element to the map that you get from going right and down. And, but as you might see, that's not too hard to prove because we can use path induction directly on, this, on, the, on the domain type x equals y. So it does in fact commute, okay? Um, which is good. So, uh, so okay. Uh, finally, as I was saying, we have F is an embedding by assumption here. So that means that this type, I mean, this uh, arrow is an equivalence. Uh, we already know that this bottom arrow is an equivalence. Um, and uh, we, uh, Right, and the problem asks us, oh yeah, and we have, a, we have this further assumption uh, already that G was an embedding as well. So that's this map here on the right. So we actually have that, we actually know that that also was an equivalence. So finally, we wanna show that H is an embedding, um, which is the top map. So we need to show that the top map is an equivalence. But uh, thankfully, we have a commuting square, and we have that all the other three maps are equivalences. Uh, so it follows immediately from the uh, three for two property that we saw, I think, I think on worksheet five, of equivalences, um, we have that uh, H that the top uh, that uh, this map here is also an equivalence, and therefore that means H is an embed. Okay, so the key was to form this commuting square. And then we got pretty easily from that, uh, th that H is an embedding. All right, uh, now uh, the converse is, is very, very similar using the same commuting square. Uh, so for part two of this problem, uh, we're also doing something very similar. Um, I, I wanna just, um, do, I, I also just wanna do one direction. So here, um, uh, suppose H is an equivalence. So we need, we're starting out with a stronger assumption than uh, an assumption of an embedding like we had in part one. So we had that H is an equivalence uh, and uh, um, we uh, now for this direction I wanna do, we're also gonna suppose that F is an embedding. Okay, cool. Um, so, so from this, we wanna show that G is also an embedding. Um, now I wanna look back at our useful square here and uh, now let me erase these parts. 
just starting from scratch again with this square. Um, so now we've, uh, we've assumed that here, we've assumed that F is embedding, so we can put this equivalence here again. And uh, we've also assumed um, uh, that uh, H is an equivalent. Um, so, uh, so uh, we could, okay, so let's think. We proved in lecture that any equivalence is an embedding. So we actually could put right away an equivalence on the top here as well, but we don't really need to use that right now. Uh, instead, we can use that three for two property of equivalences to still say something right now about what else is an equivalence in this square. So we have this on the left and on the bottom as equivalences. So that means that the composite from to the right and then down is a equivalence as well. So um, we can conclude that we have um, that this app map of G composed with H on X and Y is an equivalence as well. So we actually um, didn't even use that H is an equivalence yet to get this, to this property. But uh, what we need is uh, that uh, little g is an embedding. So we're not done. Um, there's one other thing we want to notice. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit clever. So in the interest of time, I'll just write it out. We also have a commuting triangle. Um, where we take for the top the inverse of H, because H is an equivalence, remember, recall. So H is an equivalence. And then, um, uh, so uh, we can uh, form this commuting triangle, all right? Now, um, okay. So let's think. Uh, we've uh, we have this commuting triangle. This map on the right is uh, uh, is an embedding by by this right here. That this is what it means. What we just showed for this to be an embedding. So this is an embedding. What else is an embedding? H inverse is. It's an equivalence. Any equivalence is an embedding. So. This is also an embedding. Um, what did we show in part one? We, we showed that if the right map is an embedding, then uh, H is an embedding if and only if F is an embedding. But we also know in this context, the top map is an embedding. So we can include that the left arrow is an embedding as well. As well. Sorry. Um, so by part one, I, G is an embedding, okay? So we, we apply, we've applied a bunch of closure properties that we've proven in the past to get this conclusion here. Um, the other direction in this part is, is, not, is a little bit easier. It's along the lines of part one. So this, this is the trickiest part of this problem, in my opinion. Okay, any questions on what we went over in part, uh, question three here? Okay, so I still wanna see, uh, do more things. So let me keep moving. I think I, let me think of what I, I don't think, I'm gonna need to skip something I wanted to show. Let me, uh, So, yeah, there's a, which one, uh, let me just think for a second, which one I definitely wanna do. I wanna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, skip uh, problem four um, and I'm gonna, 
try to get through problem five and then um, and then uh, go from there. Okay, so so let's look at uh, problem five here. So uh, so I want it. So in the interest of time, again, I actually uh, I do want to uh, skip even the first three parts. So uh, parts uh, one, two, and three are actually quite routine. They have very short solutions that you could look up if you want, but uh, they're good to try on your own. Are uh, are uh, quick to verify. So I'll skip them and get to the more interesting part. So let's do a uh, part four here. Uh, so uh, we have an element of a uh, type A, and we also have a uh, uh, big B, a type family over A. Uh, let's, so the problem asks us to first suppose that B of little x is a retract. of um, this one-sided identity type A equals X. Um, so this is uh, for all little x in big A. Uh, we, wanna, we wanna show that uh, we have an equivalent for each x. All right, so... Uh, Let's recall what a, uh, uh, so let's recall what it means for this to be a retract. Um, so uh, uh, what we have is uh, a couple of maps. Uh, let me call this S, a little x of little x and R of little x. And this whole thing is gonna be a commuting diagram with this, the identity map. So this is a section, this is a retraction. This is exactly what it means for um, B of x to be a retract of A equals x, okay? So um, let's show, in, so we want a, uh, we wanna show that we have actually an equivalence of B of x and uh, A equals X, we have, we have candidate maps right here in front of us. We have S of little s, X and R of little x. Um, it's not clear which one we should try to show is in fact an equivalence, but let's go with uh, R, let's, let's uh, go with uh, the family of uh, maps, uh, lambda X, R of X. Uh, the retractions. Uh, so let's show this is a family of equivalences. So each R of X is an equivalence, in other words. So let's, um, so by combining parts one, two, and three, which uh, I don't really have time to restate right here, but it's not, so check my work afterward, but from parts one, two, and three, and the fact that we have this re retract diagram here, we can form a new uh, commuting diagram of total spaces. Um, and so these are the total spaces um, that uh, we can uh, uh, we can use uh, and we can use uh, the totalization um, uh, of a function to get to fill in these arrows in the diagram. So in particular, we can take the totalization of the sections. 
and the totalizations of the retractions from above uh, and as you might expect we can similarly get the identity on the total space down here and parts one two and three let us check that uh, that from this commuting diagram here we can prove that this diagram here also commutes. So we have, we have a commuting diagram down here. What can we do from this? We can notice that as we've proven in the past in the book and lecture, this middle type is contractible. So um, what do we have now? We have, uh, We have a retract, the total space of B um, of a contractible space, contractible type. Now, I uh, recall, I put it on the, I added it to worksheet five uh, as a note on one of the problems, but it's also, uh, it's used in uh, the lecture notes from lecture seven too. Recall that, it's not too hard to prove by the way. Uh, recall that a retract, of a contractible type is also contractible. Okay. So we now have uh, we have a map totalization of the sections, and a uh, we also have another map totalization of the retractions that both. Uh, that each of them uh, has domain a contractible type and codomain a contractible type. Any any map of that form will be an equivalent. Um, okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, we actually have proven that both totalizations are a family, I mean, are equivalences. They're equivalences as maps. Oops. All right. So we've, we also want to apply, we now want to apply a further theorem from lecture. Okay, we have two totalization maps here and here that we have proved, I've just remarked that they are equivalences. Um, what do we know about, when we, what do we know? We know, what can, what can we conclude from the fact that we have a totalization function being an equivalent? There's a big theorem from the lecture notes or lecture if you attended it. There's a relationship between a totalization function being an equivalent and a property of the family of maps that you take the totalization of. Um, well, you might wanna look up or, or uh, watch again uh, the lecture to see that we, from this, we know that uh, uh, SX, S of X and R of X um, are families of equivalences, okay? So what did we show? We actually showed that, we, we, we even went further than what the problem asked. We showed that the retraction in this case and the section are, are both equivalences. So, okay, cool. We have equivalences and uh, uh, the reason I want, okay, so there's one final remark. Uh, it's that, Part five asks us to prove that if we have a dependent function, little f, that goes from the one-sided identity type to b of x, if each, if f of x for each x has a section, then f is a fit, then, then, so if this has a section, then, well, I'll just use the arrow type because we have an internal implication, then, uh, 
each f of x is an equivalence. We can apply what we just did in part four to prove this. Um, if, if it has a section, then we can form a, uh, a, uh, we can form a retract diagram. Um, uh, just like we have before. And from that retract diagram, we proved that, that this f of x is an equivalence for each x. Okay. Now, we also, in the proof, proved that s, and I'll put, it depends on x. So s of x is also, oops, sorry. Um, uh, we proved that uh, this is also an equivalence for each x. Uh, the reason I want to mention that as well is because uh, I wrote down um, a consequence here uh, that uh, says if each at function um, of a function little k has a section for all x and y, then k is an embedding because this is an equivalence, just like we have from five. But also, but you know, because we also proved that the sections are equivalences, it also works if we replace this by retraction. If each, if each of these maps has a retraction, then k is also an embedding. Okay, so that uh, answers a question that came up at the end of lecture yesterday about are all sections uh, um, are all sections embeddings? The answer is no. Uh, you can you can use the circle as a counterexample, um, but uh, there's an alternative formulation that is true, which is that if you pass to the identity types, then sections do become embeddings. Okay, cool. Um, so I uh, I know we're kind of out of time now in a way. If we think of these as just one hour sessions, I. Uh, so we just did five. I, I would like to do six. I, if there are still people sticking around, uh, and I guess this is a recording anyway. So I'm gonna go through six and, uh, and hopefully uh, some of you will stick around still. Um, all right, so, so the final one here is uh, we have a map, any map F from A to B. Um, we're gonna call it path split if, if the map itself has a right inverse or section, and furthermore, each of the uh, actions of F on the path spaces has a section. All right, so this second property looks very familiar from what we just talked about uh, from the end of problem five. So, okay, so we wanna look at this. Um, we want to we want to look at this definition and prove that a map F is an equivalence if and only if it satisfies this definition of being path split. All right. So uh, in one direction, if we if we have that F is an equivalence, then this follows easily. Of course, it has a section, right? Because it's an equivalence, and it's also so. So it therefore it has a section, and uh, it also has. So and it uh, it follows that each of these actions uh, is an equivalence as well because any equivalence is an embedding, which we proved at the end of lecture and are in the lecture notes. Is in the lecture notes. Uh, any equivalence is an embedding. Okay, so that part's pretty easy. The second, the, the reverse direction is a little, a little trickier. Um, all right, so let me start on this uh, page. So let's assume, so suppose now F is path split. Cool. Um, so, in particular, that means uh, 
we have a section of F. Um, all right, so we have a section of F. Um, and uh, from the fact that, uh, so, so we have a section of F and we also uh, know from condition two of being pass split that each of these actions is, uh, has a section. So this uh, lets us apply directly this consequence I mentioned at the end of part five of question five, which is that if each of these actions of a function has a section, then we conclude the function is an embedded. So, um, so by problem five, part five, uh, we have uh, that uh, F is also an embedding. So F is a section, sorry, F has a section and it's an embedding. So now, we want to show that F can be promoted to an equivalence. All right. Uh, so we want, so proving that F is an equivalence is the same thing as proving that for each B in big B, the codomain of F, the fiber of F over little b is contractible, all right? So how do we prove a type is contractible? Here's one way we can do it. So prove that, and let me uh, call this for brevity, big F, this type. Prove F is inhabited and that um, for all uh, x and y of f, we actually have an identity between those two arbitrary elements. All right. So let's first go. Let's first go about proving that. F is inhabited. Uh, well, let me write this way. So can we, I want to construct an element of big F. How do I do that? Uh, well, what data do we have? We have, uh, in, the, in the context, we have a, uh, an element, little b, a big B. So we can use the section that we have of F, apply it to little b, and then we can, uh, we can thus get an element of big F because since it's a section, uh, if we write out F applied to the section applied to b, then this is in fact equal to be. So that proves it's an element of the fiber. So finally, we need to, uh, um, we need to consider, so, okay, so finally, I uh, consider um, uh, two elements uh, of the fiber. Um, and these are arbitrary because, uh, because I can use sigma induction to write them as pairs, right? So these are perfectly arbitrary elements. And we just, we, we need to show that these are, these are equal, that we can construct a term of the identity type between these two. All right. So this is, uh, okay. So this is where I think uh, it gets less intuitive and just kind of a trick, um, this part of the proof. So let me write it out. Since F is an embedding, which we've proven, 
at this point. Uh, we, uh, we have an inverse map. of the action of F on A and A prime. So this goes from an identity, an identity type like this to A equals A prime. All right, so we have this inverse and we can, uh, for brevity, let's call it phi. So I can apply this inverse to, uh, to the second component, P, concatenated with the inverse path, the inverse of the path, U. Um, all right, so I apply that. And what is, what, what is this uh, term? What type does this term have? Well, it actually, um, has the term of this codomain as expected. You might want to verify that this has the right type that you can apply phi to. So this is uh, an element of uh, f of a equals f of a prime. So okay. So uh, so cool. We have uh, so let me. Sorry for all the new notation, but let me abbreviate this by little q, this, this uh, term of a equals a prime. Now, cool. So, okay, let's, let's just take a second to see what we're doing. We, we're trying to prove that we have an identity of this form. You might remember that uh, by the characterization of uh, the identi of identity types of fibers or, you know, which is a special case of, ident of the characterization of identity types of sigma types. Uh, we, uh, this amounts to proving a, uh, a, um, an identity between A and A prime, as well as an identity um, of the transport. So, uh, so we, let me reuse Q because this is the one we're gonna use this term. Um, um, of the transport on Q um, and then on uh, uh, P, uh, we wanna prove that this is equal to the second component here, U. And uh, in this case, uh, what is the type family that transport's using? It's, uh, it's over, uh, a and it uh, it is this identity type f of x equals b. Okay. So this is uh, so we have this element. We need to construct an element of this identity type. So here's uh, essentially the final step. So the transport. Um, here is equal, it's a, it, this is a lemma from the book or a past lecture um, of this is little q. Um, so all this, the inverse of this concatenated with little p. So that's a lemma that we're applying here. So that's what the transport equals. In this particular case, we can unfold q. Uh, q is uh, this phi applied to p concatenated with u inverse. Um, so ultimately, when we unfold everything, this uh, is equal to the inverse of P concatenated U inverse with P, which now we finally see is equal to U. So as a result, we do in fact get an element of this identity type, which 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, uh, we do in fact get an element of uh, this identity type, which in turn gives us an element of uh, this identity between the pairs, which we want. Okay. Cool. So uh, again, full solutions are on GitHub to each problem. Any uh, questions about problem six here that we just went over? Okay. So since this is the end of the worksheet, I will stop sharing and I'm gonna stop recording now.